Namaste. Uh, a very warm welcome to our uh, youth conclave. Uh, and this is the most awaited session of this conclave. Okay. I must say that. And uh, the topic of discussion is reimagining Indian history, challenges and opportunity. When we live in a time when reclaiming Indian history or reimagining Indian history or rewriting Indian history are buzzwords. And beyond the buzzwords are creating a hype behind these words. Is there a way forward? That is what we are trying to look in, in this session. And we have a special guest to discuss the topic. We have Vikram Sambad. Dr. Vikram Sambad is actually an academician. I must say this is one of the finest academicians of our time. And he's the author of six acclaimed books. Uh, and his latest book, uh, two volume biography about Savarkar. Savarkar echoes from the forgotten past and Savarkar the contested legacy. Both of which has gone, gone on to become the national bestsellers and acclaimed, widely acclaimed by people in the academics and acclaimed by our Honorable Prime Minister Narendra Modi. And uh, Sambath was, Dr. Sambath was recently conferred with the honor of being elected as the fellow of UK, UK's prestigious Royal History Society. And he was awarded the Sahitya Academy Award. Sahitya Academy first Yuva Puraskar in English Literature and He's also, uh, he was also the four writers and artists to be selected as writer in residence at the, uh, by the, in the Rashtrapati Bhavan in 2015. And he's a doctorate, he has doctorate in history and music from Queensland, University of Queensland, Australia. And he's actually an engineer, like me, he's an engineer turned into academics. So it is, it is actually an honor for me to welcome uh, Sambath to Kerala and Especially, I welcome you to the land of Padmanabha Swami, <laughs> so the deity of the land. <laughs> so, uh, coming straight away to the topic, the topic of the discussion today is reimagining Indian history. So, really, I have this doubt. Like, what is there to reimagine about Indian history? Because Arun Shuri often says this, the eminent historians, no? They have written history for us, even though that is not factual or actual. It is something which is, which is already done. It is I mean, like done and dusted. So what is there? Is there a possibility to reimagine or rethink or reclaim something which is, which is, I mean like, is there anything pending? So. First of all, a very good morning to all of you. And it's a great honor, a great pleasure to be in the land of Lord Padmanabha Swami. And I feel very handicapped by the fact that I don't know your beautiful language. And uh, unlike the lovely session that was going on before this, we have to talk in a colonial language, uh, but so be it. So your question, Surajji, about reimagining. So what does this word reimagine itself mean? It means to recreate or to reinterpret, usually a work of art or a work of literature and so on. But when it comes to history, is it possible to reimagine it? Is it possible to recreate it, reinterpret it? And I think history allows itself for such retellings. A very famous historian had said, every work of history is an interim report. You know, what, uh, whatever work is there, it is not the final word on history. It's just an interim report. So someone else can come, someone else can do a better research, someone else can do a better job than what has already been done, and you will have a completely different account of history. Uh, I usually liken history, we are in Kerala where the elephant is, uh, you know, all pervasive. There's the story of the blind man and the elephant, that poem that we all studied as kids. So there's an elephant in the room and all the blind men are asked to touch different parts of the elephant and say, how does the elephant look? So someone touches the tusk and says the elephant is very sharp. Someone touches the body and says the elephant is very vast. Someone touches the tail and says the elephant is very thin. Someone touches something else and you know the trunk and he gets a different idea of what the elephant is. I think history writing is very similar. History is that elephant in the room and all of us historians who are trying to analyze this past are those blind men who are touching different parts of the elephant and based on that coming to conclusions. Now there are three paradoxes when it comes to this discipline of history itself. The first one 
the past by virtue of being the past is not present right so unlike physical phenomenon like a chemistry lab or a physics lab or whatever where you can actually see for yourself what is happening the past cannot be seen as you rightly said it has already occurred so the past is not present so how do you reconstruct this past you, you do it through sources sources like archaeological sources epigraphic sources uh, inscriptions uh, textual sources all of that but many of these sources may themselves be incomplete or compromised you know somebody who's a court historian who's writing the story of his ruler obviously they will not be objective about the ruler that they're writing about so uh, it's a it's a biased source Sim similarly during invasions a lot of monuments may have been destroyed so the archaeological evidence that you have is incomplete or compromised so the sources are compromised the third paradox is the modern day historian who is accessing these sources he or she comes with his or her own biases that could be their political ideology their lack of expertise their lack of understanding someone who's doing study of indian history without the knowledge of say sanskrit or persian so you you are limited by your capabilities there so all these three paradoxes the past not being present uh, the sources being compromised and the inherent biases of the person who is accessing those sources all this makes history a very very mediated and a compromised kind of a discipline and that is why there is no absolute truth when it comes to history and every historian needs to have that humility that they are just trying to as i go back to that example of the blind man trying to touch different parts of the elephant and trying to make sense of it so reimagining it reinterpreting it and retelling that story becomes possible when it comes to history so i uh, like when you bring in the point of uh, biases of historians so like you know people who touch only a certain part of an elephant and uh, describing an elephant but i have a i have a serious question there like few weeks you know few days before prime minister narendra modi addressed Indian Indians from the Red Fort, where he said Guru Tej Bahadur stood up against Aurangzeb. So, like the very next day, there were media's like wire to Telegraph. You no know, people started writing saying that this is a story to polarize the Indian society. So, if such is the case, there is a certain section of the, uh, the people who don't want to hear the other side of the story. So, if such is the case, uh, such is the case. You no, know, is there a possibility to really? bring those stories no which were actually hidden under the carpet or swept under the carpet, carpet like as a historian Correct. how will you do it that's what a lot of us are trying to do <laughs> uh, you know trying to swim against the tide and ensure that these stories come out uh, that's a very important question that you know anything that talks about the darker episodes of indian history particularly when it comes to the long centuries of foreign domination and invasions somehow indian historians try to whitewash that try to put all of that under the carpet and give it a very nice spin now we are not supposed to talk about i mean will durant the american historian called the islamic conquest of india as one of the bloodiest stories of human history not just of indian but human history it was one of the bloodiest stories but do we really do our textbooks or our other books or our discourse does that cover that in the same measure um, unfortunately it doesn't and even if someone of the eminence of the prime minister brings this up this is taken as polarizing and so on so why does this actually happen i mean all the time we think that talking about these excesses of the past is somehow going to upset the society today you are going to offend more specifically the muslims of today which i don't think uh, is the case at all a young muslim boy or girl is not responsible for the invasions of ghazni and ghori and tipu sultan and aurangzeb and all of that and conversely to make the current today's muslims happy you don't have to make icons out of such tyrants and then you know whitewash their story and present it to uh, them in such a sanitized fashion you spoke of arun shauri and eminent historians i'll quote in this very example of one such eminent historian romila thapar 
who very famously, you know, constantly told us that when Mahmud of Ghazni attacked the Somnath Mandir um, several times, this was not done out of any uh, religious, uh, uh, you know, drive. It was only for economic reasons. There was so much wealth, so the corrupt Brahmins were putting in a lot of wealth in the temples, and so, uh, you know, Mahmud Ghazni came there and destroyed it. That is what is told. But when you go to the actual sources, Al-Baruni and others, who actually were contemporaries who wrote the Persian chronicles of Mahmud Ghazni, what, what is the story that comes there? So Mahmud Ghazni is supposed to have gone to Somnath. First of all, he came to Gujarat. The king of Gujarat, the Chalukya king, had run away, Bhima Deva, and he had a free pass. He went away to Somnath, and he was quite surprised to see that almost 50,000 Hindus common Hindus, not soldiers of the king because the king had run away. They were there to defend this temple which was like a fortress. And it took him three to four days to actually kill all of them, vanquish them and enter the temple. When he enters the Garbhagriha, and this is all not some story I am trying to make up, but it is there in the Persian chronicles of Muhammad Ghazni's own, you know, uh, court historians and others. When he enters the Garbhagriha, the, the, the priests come running to him and say, you know, save our Lord. You want money? I'll give you as much money as you want. Maybe twice as much that is there in this temple. Take it and, you know, save our uh, deity. To which Muhammad laughs and says that if I do that, I will be called as Muhammad, the trader of uh, idols. I do not want to be called that. I want to be called Butshikan or a breaker of idols, uh, not as a trader of idols. So, the contemporary records talk about all this, but today's historians whitewash that and give us a completely different, uh, you know, narrative. Now, historians like K.S. Lal have mentioned that between 1000 CE and 1525 CE, the population of the subcontinent fell by 8 crores. 8 crores is an underestimate of the number of Hindus Buddhists, Jains and others of the Indic faiths who were massacred during those 500 years. Now in the Second World War, 60 lakh Jews were killed and we call that the Holocaust. So what do we call this uh, genocide of the Hindus for 500 long years? Sitaram Goyal uh, documents that at least 40,000 temples in the very least were desecrated during the early uh, centuries of uh, Muslim invasions. So where are these temples? Even to reclaim one or two of that, we have to go to the courts, fight it for several decades and a century and over, just one or two sacred spaces. So, and you know, our places of learning were destroyed, places like Nalanda, Takshashila, Vikramshila, and all these universities. It is said that when Bhaktiar uh, Khilji attacked Nalanda, 90 lakh manuscripts, not one or two, 90 lakh manuscripts were actually burnt and the uh, Nalanda University burnt for several months. That was the amount of knowledge that that place had. We, but today you go a little out of Nalanda, the place is actually called Bhaktiarpur. <laughs> so which other country in this whole world would actually, you know, praise and eulogize a man who destroyed your highest seats of learning, your Princeton, your Harvard, your Stanford, and uh, you know, something like that. But we do that in this country. Almost four lakh Hindu women who were sent away to Ghazni and uh, uh, auctioned away as sex slaves. Uh, in fact, in Ghazni there is a tower where there is this saying that goes there, Duktare Hindustan, Nilame Do Dinar. For two dinars, the daughter of Hindu, daughters of Hindustan are auctioned here. So all of this has happened. Now talking about that is somehow considered to be polarizing, which is completely wrong. I think, as I said uh, earlier, the onus of all these atrocities is not on today's Muslims of India. And we need to talk about this openly because history is not just a catalog of events. It also tells us that these kind of incidents should never happen again in our subcontinent. And we are seeing that happening in our vicinity. 
what is happening in Afghanistan, what is happening in Pakistan or Bangladesh, where the minority, pop, uh, the Hindu population or the Christian population, the, the minorities in those countries, the steady decline in their uh, numbers, uh, the destruction of the Bamiyan Buddhas, the destruction of temples that happens routinely, ISKCON temple in Bangladesh or any of these, show that this is not, this is the Delhi Sultanate is very much alive. <laughs> the, the same tendencies that were there during those invasions are very much alive. So our, the, the role of history should be to tell today's Indian Muslims that these are not your icons. If you really want icons from your own community, you have several of them, Dara Shiko, uh, you have uh, Ras Khan, you have Rahim, you have Santa Shishunal Sharif, from Karnataka, you have Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam, you have the governor of our state uh, of Kerala, Arif Mohammad Khan Saab. So there are several of them who can be your icons. You know, for that you don't need to whitewash Tipu and Ghori and Ghazni and say that these are your icons. First of all, that assumption is false that a Muslim need to have a Muslim icon only. You can have a Hindu or a Christian or anybody else. But if you really want to have someone of your own community, there are several such cases uh, of examples of, uh, you know, syncretic, um, you know, Muslims as well, which can be done. But sadly, we don't do that. And that's a very, very important fault line when it comes to Indian historiography. Sorry for a very long answer to your short question. I like creating icons, no. No, yes, there are people like Kabir to, uh, as you said, Ras Khan to, uh, even Arif Muhammad Khan to, uh, Abdul Kalam. But, uh, I mean like, even the people who are in the field of academics, no, they're not pointing to that. I mean like instead what they do is like, when you come up with a story about Aurangzeb or even, for instance, the story from Nalanda, Bhakti Arkilji, no, they say that it is to disturb the current social scenario or to, uh, disturb, to polarize the Indian society furthermore. So, like, I would like to switch from that, creating icon, to an icon you, I think, you are trying to create. That is what uh, the people on the left says, like Veer Savarkar, for instance. You are the one, one academician who took that courage to write about Sav Veer Savarkar, and he's undoubtedly a uh, like a controversial figure, who's considered as a controversial figure. And. Uh, let me ask you this, like, was Savarkar a British stooge, like, pro, uh, like promoted by the uh, left, left historians, look, they call him a British stooge, or was he a strategic nationalist who really you know, tried a lot for this nation? Can you just? Yeah. Well, uh, a little on Savarkar's life itself, I mean, he was arrested in Kalapani in the Andamans where he underwent the worst of tortures and that was in 1910. He rotted there literally for 11 years, another three years in jails in India, so 14 years of imprisonment, and then 13 years he was put under house arrest in Ratnagiri. So 27, 14 plus 13, 27 long years of a young man who had gone to London to become a lawyer, uh, you know, spent either in jail or in house arrest. Now, in the interim, if this man had become a stooge, as is alleged, uh, he was a very intelligent person, he was English educated, he was trained in law, so the British would have made use of him. You know, they would have taken him over to their side, especially after 1937 when government started getting formed in various parts of India. Uh, he would have probably become a part of the Viceroy's Council, he would have probably become the Prime Minister of Bombay State, so if you were a stooge, the British would have taken you onto their side because they know who is useful to them. On the other hand, he was constantly put under surveillance. All through his 13 years, even in Ratnagiri, uh, there were spies all the time, surveillance all the time, and every letter that came in and out of Savarkar's house was scrutinized very, very deeply, and the British never trusted him. And these, I, in my books, I mention through British intelligence reports as to how the British said this man is not to be trusted. So when it is the British rep reports themselves which talk about all this, I see no reason to say that he was a stooge or whatever else. I mean, these kind of things can be repeatedly said, but there is no factual basis to that, including during the Second World War when he was 
alleged to have started recruiting uh, Indians to the uh, British Indian Army, there was a reason for that that he was doing, not to help the British, but to ensure that the Hindus actually get trained in military warfare. Now, even someone like Dr. Ambedkar had mentioned, uh, you know, his mentions in his book, Pakistan and Thoughts on Partition, that the communal composition of the British Indian Army was very, very skewed. Almost 60% of it was Muslims, largely from the Northwest Frontier Province. And he also, Dr. Ambedkar himself says, this is quite an alarming trend that Hindus need to watch out for. You know, on the one hand, one community is made very pusillanimous with ahimsa and all of that. On the other hand, another community is so deeply ingrained with military training. So obviously, in the event of a civil war, which was to happen between the two communities, one would have an upper hand. So the idea of people like Savarkar and the Hindu Mahasabha was enter the British Army, and this was particularly for the Hindus of India, enter the British Army in large numbers, get trained in warfare, so that you can defend yourself, your faith, your properties, your women, and all of that. And also, a lot of these uh, people who were recruited would then defect to the Indian National Army or the Azad Hind Forge of Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose uh, and give a feeder circuit to the INA. So these were the dual purposes for which he recruited people to the army. But we don't consider all these details and then we call, put these tags and labels, which is a very, very usual leftist, uh, you know, tendency to put labels on other people. As Arun Shauri had mentioned in his book, uh, in India, you become secular by calling everyone else communal. So, you know, that is how, <laughs> you know, these people operate. But I have it out. Like, uh, in 1940s, if I rightly remember, Savarkar came to the Madurai uh, Hindu Mahasabha uh, Sammelan and he said, like the Hindus, uh, you mentioned about it, but I just want a clarity in that. Like, Hindus in large numbers should uh, take part or jo try to join in the British Army in the different uh, sectors. And that was the same time when Gandhi was doing Satyagraha against the Britishers. So look at that, that situation. Like when Bose was actually creating an army to fight against the Britishers, this person was saying to associate with the Britishers, like the Hindus in large masses. So that was a statement actually. So there is something like that. So can we really say that he was loyal to the Indians or was he loyal to the Britishers? So as I said, the idea to recruit to the army was not to help the British. It was to gain training in military warfare and to help Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose too. Netaji, before escaping to uh, out of India, six months before he supposed to have met Savarkar at his house in June 1940, uh, in his house in Bombay, and the two of them had a secret meeting that went on for several hours. And uh, Savarkar's secretary, it's a secret meeting, so we don't know what exactly transpired, but during that time, Savarkar is supposed to have inspired him saying, leave India, there's no point doing these civil disobedience movements. We're not going to get freedom because of that. The only way is enemy's enemy is your friend. So if the British enemies during the, in the Second World War, the Axis powers, so join hands with them. And he also introduced him to Rash Bihari Bose. Rash Bihari Bose was the founder of the INA. And Rash Bihari was a great admirer of Savarkar, right? From 1937, I have quoted in my book several of Rash Bihari Bose's letters to Savarkar. He also called him a, you know, rising leader of New India. Uh, he formed a chapter of the Hindu Mahasabha in Japan, translated all of Savarkar's works into Japanese. So, uh, Savarkar is supposed to have connected the two of them, and the rest, as they say, is history. So this idea that he was recruiting people to uh, side with the British, by that standards in the First World War, Mahatma Gandhi was recruiting Indians to the British Indian Army. Uh, he also got a medal called Kaisare Hind, uh, you know, for be his being loyal to the British during the Boer War and the Zulu conflict and all of that. So. Can we call Gandhiji also a stooge? So, you know, so these things uh, need to be seen with a little more facts and nuance and so on. Uh, but what about those letters no, which he wrote, like you know, when I stay in, uh, in Andaman jail and in Ratnagiri as well, like the five petitions no, which he wrote? Like you often, I mean, like you were the first one to say that this is.
those were not mercy petitions. No, I often hear it as mercy petitions, actually. So like, um, what was the reason for uh, writing those letters and the way in which she wrote? Like, if that was a standard template, can you name few other Indian freedom fighters who wrote in the same template? Yeah. So that's a good question because uh, this is also brought up several times. Uh, you know, it was a very common practice. It, just like you, uh, a prisoner could have a lawyer, so also they could, a political prisoner could write petitions to the government to, uh, you know, release them from the prison. And mind you, Savarkar actually had the uh, harshest, one of the harshest punishments after execution, which was two life terms to, of imprisonment, 25 plus 25, 50 long years to be rotting in the jail. Now, what does a young man do? Uh, are you supposed to continue to rot there, where the most inhuman tortures are meted to you? Or are you going to try every legal way to come out and then, you know, make yourself uh, more useful to the country? Uh, of course, if he had been executed, would he still have written a petition? No one knows. I mean, those are conjectures. But here, he was not executed. He had to just rot there for such a long time. Now, many of the others, like Barin Ghosh, Aurobindo Ghosh's brother, who was from the Anushilan Samiti, he wrote a petition. Uh, why? I mean, much later in 1925, you had someone like uh, S.A. Dange, who was the founder of the CPI, the Communist Party of India, who wrote a petition very similar to that that Savarkar wrote, uh, saying, please leave me, I'll be ever loyal to the British and so on. So if Savarkar is a stooge, then the founder of the CPI is also someone who wrote a petition. So, you know, these things and we had um, Sachindranath Sanyal, the great revolutionary who founded the HRA. Uh, he wrote a petition too and in his memoirs called Mera Bandi Jeevan, he says, I was advised by Savarkar to write a petition. I wrote same kind of format that he did. I was released but Savarkar and his elder brother, they were not released and he gives the reason also that, you know, releasing him would reignite the revolutionary spirit that was there in Bombay presidency and therefore uh, the British were very apprehensive of leaving him uh, out. But when we see the British records itself, there was someone called Sir Reginald Craddock who came all the way to interview some of these political prisoners and in his official documents, Craddock says, I interviewed Savarkar. Uh, but he shows no regret or repentance or remorse for what he did. Now, this is a British official who is writing in an official jotting. Why on earth would the British actually write something like this? So, you had his contemporaries in the prison who were saying that they were also writing petitions. You had the British themselves saying, you know, that uh, uh, he did not show any regret or repentance. He could have fallen flat on uh, Craddock's feet and say, please leave me right now. He did nothing of that. In 1920, when all the other prisoners were let off, especially after the World War and all that, and when the capital of India got shifted from Calcutta to Delhi, uh, you had Emperor George V, who was in his royal proclamation, uh, you know, releasing several political prisoners. But at that time, when Savarkar was not released, his younger brother, Narayan Rao, approaches Mahatma Gandhi and says, can you please help my brothers? They have been rotting there for 10 long years. And then Gandhiji himself tells uh, Narayan Rao, tell your brothers to write a petition. And I will also put a petition on their behalf uh, to the British and tell them that, and he wrote that actually. And he even wrote, Gandhiji wrote an entire article in Young India uh, in 1920 May, saying, you know, these are young men, they're very brave, patriotic, they've got misled. Now they want to come back into the mainstream, so let us allow that to happen. So if writing a petition was such a bad thing, why did Gandhiji actually advise him to write a petition? So I think this needs to be seen in a historical context. For today's politics, people can say many things, but that necessarily does not have any historical basis. Actually, that is fascinating in a sense. You know, S.A. Dange wrote in the same, same template. Yeah. You know, I, I don't think that many of us know that. So like, uh, but again, after uh, 1924, when you know, he got released from the Radnagiri uh, jail, he wrote and got pensions from Britishers, I think. And that is again considered as 
and someone who show, shown his loyalty towards the Britishers rather than to the Indians. Even that is again a, I, I don't know whether that is again a left historian's narrative, uh, but it is over, often, I mean like I often hear that, like you know, he took pensions from the Britishers, so he was loyal to the Britishers. Maybe the template Dange used it, but here, I don't so know whether uh, yeah. any other people were there you know, who took money from. Yeah. So in fact, during my research, I came across the fact that several uh, revolutionaries in Bengal, now the revolutionary movement was largely focused in Maharashtra, Bengal, Punjab. Now the revolutionaries of Bengal were given a pension of 150 rupees per month. Uh, why was the British doing that because most of these revolutionaries, uh, you know, their degrees would be taken away from them. Even Savarkar, his uh, bachelor's degree, his master's degree, his law degree, all of that was taken away from him. His property was auctioned uh, when he was arrested. The ladies of the household literally had to beg money to survive and eke out a living. Uh, and so there was no property, there was no degree. How do, how do they earn their livelihood? Uh, when he gets released, he asks the British, uh, I'm a trained lawyer, can I practice in the court? And the British refused that. So many of the revolutionaries, they did, their educational qualifications had been taken away from them. And so to give them a, a source of livelihood and sustenance, the British used to give some amount of money as pension to most of these political prisoners. Even in that, as I said, the Bengal revolutionaries used to get 150 rupees. When Savarkar's case came for a review in 1924, it was rejected. It was only in 1929 that he started getting a pension that to half, less than half the amount of 60 rupees per month. And it was there only till 1937 when he was completely released. So those eight years when he was under house arrest, that was when he was given the pension. And to your first question uh, also, the conditions of release to Ratnagiri was only for five years, uh, you know, you, uh, you have to stay away from politics and be confined to Ratnagiri. But every five years when his case came up for a review, the British would say he is not to be trusted, so let us extend the period of captivity. So from five years, it actually became 13 years. So that again shows that if you actually trusted the man and he was on your side, why would you extend his captivity? you know, from five years to 13 long years. So during those eight years, uh, after the first five years, that was when he got this pension, like several other revolutionaries did. Okay, great. Uh, now, one or two questions about Sarkar again. Like one would be, like in the first book, in chapter three, you use, the, the, the name of the chapter is Birth of a Revolutionary. So, I don't know whether you are the first one to call him uh, under the category of revolutionaries. Because, you know, we hear that he was, he was not, he was a stooge. Now, these are the words you know, which we often hear about Savarkar. So, can we place him under the, or can we place him along with people like Sukhdev, Rajguru, Asad, or uh, Subhash Bose? Like, if he, he was a revolutionary, but he was not projected like that, yeah. till now at least. No, that's very sad. Uh, consider the fact that here was a man who founded India's first organized secret society. First organized secret society based on Italian revolutionaries, Mazzini and Garibaldi. This was called the Mitra Mela, which later became Abhinav Bharat. Uh, he organized the first ever student bonfire of foreign clothes in the Ferguson College in 1905, protesting against the partition of Bengal. And the five years that he lived in London as a student, those were stormy years where, you know, several other, uh, you know, fascinating characters of the revolutionary movement that I came across, which I didn't know about, which our history textbooks seldom talk about, Shamji Krishnavarma, Madam Bhikaji Kama, Virendranath Chattopadhyay, Lala Hardayal, who founded the Gadar Party, uh, Madan Lal Dhingra, VVS Iyer, MPT Acharya, all these people were operating out of London. And Savarkar was almost like a leader of all of them. And while in London, he also wrote this book on the 1857 uprising. Uh, and he was the one who coined the word that it was the first war of Indian independence, which was still then called as the Sepoy Mutiny by the British. 
he gave it a respectability of being the first war of Indian independence and that book served as a veritable Bible for revolutionaries decades later. Bhagat Singh is supposed to have used that book as an entry criteria for anybody who was entering the HSRA. Uh, you know, I came across an interview of one of the revolutionaries, Durga Das Khanna, who said, who was a part of the revolutionary movement. Uh, he's, he said, when I was young, I was interviewed by Bhagat Singh and Sukhdev and all of these people, and they asked me, have you read Savarkar's 1857 book? And when he said yes, that was when he was recruited into the organization. So it was such an important book that he wrote. And also the book was used by the INA, by Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose. It became a source of inspiration for revolutionaries later. So obviously someone who believed in the armed struggle uh, for Indian liberation, uh, who gave it an intellectual corpus, uh, uh, you know, and gave it some sense of uh, ideological underpinnings should be considered as a revolutionary. It's sad that he was not given that due so far. But that also goes on to uh, talk, Surajji, about the parallel stream of Indian independence. We're talking about reimagining history. So when the, we talk of the freedom movement, we are told a very simple story, like a Attenborough film, uh, you know, and that famous song, Dedi Hame Azadi Bina Khadga Bina Bhal Sabar Mati Ke Sant Tune Kar Diya Kamal. So, you know, without any, we, we politely asked the British quit India and they got fed up one day and just quit India. Is that how uh, the biggest colonizing power actually treated India? Um, while the mass movement that Gandhiji and the Congress launched was extremely important, it spurred that sense of nationalism there was an unending chain of armed struggle, right from 1857 till 1946 when you had the naval mutiny in Bombay and you also had the INA and it was those things which actually got India her freedom. Uh, in fact, after independence in 1952, you had Lord Clement Attlee who comes to India. He was the Prime Minister of Britain when the transfer of power happened and he comes in 1952 or 53 and he meets, he comes to Calcutta, he meets uh, Justice Phanibhushan Chakrabarti, who was the governor of Bengal and also the acting uh, chief justice of the Bengal High Court. And in his memoirs, Chakrabarti writes that when he asked Atli, why did you leave India so, so suddenly? You know, no one expected that you would leave us uh, so soon. So uh, Atli is on record having said that it was the activities of Netaji Subhash Bose and the INA, which is what uh, proved to be the last nail in the coffin, because as it is, Britain was impoverished after the Second World War. This was a revolt in the army was the last thing that they could afford to have. Then Atli actually, uh, no, uh, Chakraborty asked him, what about the Quit India movement? What about the role of Gandhi in your final decision to leave India? And with a smirk on his face, Atli says, minimal and this this is not this is actually on record what chakraborty puts in his memoirs so i think there is a need now especially in this amrit mahotsa when we are celebrating 75 years of our freedom to look back on our freedom movement with a more dispassionate unemotional and a rational uh, view as to what were the drivers what actually got us our freedom? Who are those heroes and heroines whom we have forgotten in all these decades? And can we be a more grateful nation and actually uh, pay our just tributes to all these people? Nice. Uh, maybe the mainstream freedom fighters, you know, whom we now learn or read as mainstream freedom uh, fighters, their contribution may be minimal, as you said. but one term which actually attributed to Savarkar, Hindutva, the term which was actually coined by Chandradas Basu. So, but many things that it was actually Savarkar who coined the term, but yes, Savarkar wrote extensively about Hindutva. But when I read Savarkar's work, you no, know, I am not able to find anything you know, which is connected with the ritualistic or the spiritual part of uh, the so-called Hindu community. But uh, he's now the icon of Hindutva politics or uh, the Hindu community, yeah. for instance. So, so, can you please elaborate about the exact idea of Hindutva, which was written by Savarkar? Yeah. 
that's an important question because uh, we see the context also. History is all about looking at context, you know, in what context people did what they did. So this was towards 1919, 1920, you had in India the dangerous movement, according to me, of the Khilafat uh, agitation. What was the Khilafat movement for some of the young people who may not know uh, is that after the First World War, Britain defeated Turkey and the caliph uh, of Turkey was disposed, disposed, uh, deposed and in his place, uh, Mustafa Kemal Ataturk was made the uh, leader. Now, many people in Turkey did not want the caliph who was very oppressive and so on. But since the caliph was considered as a successor of the holy prophet, so a lot of Muslims in India were mobilized on that basis by Gandhi with the assumption that with this Hindus and Muslims will come together and Muslims were not participating in the Congress movement till then. So to gain their support, he tossed this carrot saying, we will support you to establish a caliphate in Turkey. In return, you participate in the non-cooperation movement. Uh, now, just imagine the illogic of this whole, uh, you know, proposition. Turkey is a country thousands of miles away. We are a slave nation, uh, you know, a, a colony. Here, if a few people raise slogans and black flags, the British will not put a ruler there of our choice, uh, especially when they have won that country in, uh, in war. But still, on a very, very communal agenda, the Muslims of India were being mobilized. Now, obviously, and Gandhi also promised that within one year of starting this movement, the caliphate will be established and also Swaraj would be got. Now, both of these did not happen. Now, the repercussions of particularly the failure of the Khilafat movement ensured they were widespread, uh, you know, Hindu-Muslim riots all through the 1920s, a lot of genocides, including in Malabar, you had the Mopla, uh, uprising in 1921, which just we have commemorated 100 years of that. There were riots all over India. And every time this happened, the reaction of the Congress and particularly of Gandhi was very, very, uh, you know, uh, pusillanimous to say the least. In 1926, when Swami Shraddhanand of the Arya Samaj was uh, killed by a Muslim fanatic, Abdul Rashid. Gandhi is supposed to have said that I don't even consider him as an assassin. He is my dear brother Abdul Rashid. Uh, we have to get into the psyche of the assassin to understand why he picked up the gun and killed. So, uh, unfortunately, Gandhians two decades later did not get into the psyche of my dear brother Godse to understand why he killed uh, Gandhi, which was a heinous crime nonetheless. But uh, you know, so these kind of reactions that came from Gandhi and the Congress necessitated that there needed to be an intellectual counter for someone because the Hindus were being led down a garden path to their own destruction. And that is when from the confines of his jail, Savarkar wrote his Hindutva treatise in which he said, uh, this has not, you are right, he said this has nothing to do with the theological aspects of Hinduism, uh, the rituals, the spiritual aspect, afterlife, God, super soul, I have nothing to do with that, that all the saints and sages, they can uh, deal with that. This was more a kind of a Hindutva, according to me, were two things. One is Hinduism that resists, you know. Uh, in the uh, wake of pan-Islamist tendencies across India, uh, the, it was a response to that to ensure that there was a resistance that was put, political uh, Political Islam's answer was Hindutva. The other aspect of Hindutva was also Hindu modernity. Uh, very few people would actually identify just as Savarkar as a revolutionary, Savarkar as a social reformer. Uh, you know, where in the 13 years in Ratnagiri, he advocated for a completely casteless society, um, dismantling of the caste system in, in toto, and the Varnashram system itself. Uh, and where he and Ambedkar had a lot in common uh, in their views and Ambedkar also wrote several letters uh, to Savarkar praising him for this. Intercaste dining, intercaste marriage, uh, the first ever temple, Patit Pavan Mandir in Ratnagiri where people of all castes could go and worship 
there was a asprashya ganapati an untouchable ganapati so to say where uh, even the the priest would be someone from the lowest of the caste and even the brahmin had to go and touch his feet to take uh, blessings so all these aspects so it it actually helped the cause of hindutva to unite hindu society which was fragmented into so many castes and creeds and communities and so hi hinduism that raises and also hinduism that looks at modernity social reform that was what hindutva was of savarkar but all through his tenure even as the president of the all india hindu mahasabha he said that you know the hindu rashtra that he conceptualized in that nobody is going to get a unfair advantage you know the majority will not get extra privileges only because they are more in number similarly the minorities will not get any concessions because they are a minority in the eyes of the law everybody is the same whatever puja namaz etc you want to do you do it in the confines of your house don't bring it bring it into the public space uh, so what more is secularism i mean uh, if you want to distance state and religion this was what it was and he said the minorities need not even have a ghost of suspicion in their mind that their legitimate political linguistic cultural and religious rights would be infringed upon and if there is an infringement like that then the state will intervene to remove those infringements so it was talking about a equal society where of course it's a hindu nation by its culture by its past but we but one where nobody is a second rate citizen nobody is given a second class status everybody is equal of course the the rss at that time and golwalkar uh, ji's ideas were different savarkar was different uh, savarkar never was part of the rss so these different streams and branches of hindutva that also is something that we need to keep in mind okay so fi finally that means uh, savarkar was not an anti muslim person okay fine now in the last 45 minutes you no know, you have uh brought up certain things you no know, which i think you no know, it should be brought to the mainstream like so there is a possibility to reclaim or reimagine the history but let me ask you this question it is actually a loaded question why because uh in a sense uh in kashmiri files you no know, there is a dialogue like सिस्टम तो उनकी है नो नो सरकार तो उनकी है मगर सिस्टम हमारा है सो यू नो आर यू गेटिंग यू पीपल लाइक यू हिंदोल सिंह गुप्ता टू संजीव सन्याल और साई दीपक आर यू गाइज गेटिंग आनंद रंगनाथन जी फॉर इंस्टेंस आर यू गाइज गेटिंग इनफ सपोर्ट फ्रॉम द सिस्टम बिकॉज नो टू अंडर समथिंग नो विच इज अंडर द कारपेट और नो ब्रिंग दो फैक्ट्स नो विच इज एक्चुअली ही डन टू अपीस और एस यू सेट लाइक टू Uh, to satisfy certain section of the society you know, to honor those things you no know, you need you need the support from the system so and the kashmir file says that system to unki hai so like are you guys getting a support from the system ab marwaoge mujhe to you know anand my dear friend and brother anand ranganathan and i were having this chat last night also i'm glad that the system is not helping us i think it's sometimes better that you stay away from government you stay away from political parties and all of that and do your work quietly as an independent uh, person that way we get the opportunity to even uh, you know uh, criticize the government for its failings and so on so i think that is important none of us are beneficiaries of the system Uh, we are all doing our stuff quietly in our own confines and hoping that this will bring about some amount of change uh, in society in in our own little ways uh, small small steps are what lead to mount everest so you know that's that's the whole idea actually but i must also uh, suraj ji mention uh, since we're talking about reimagining indian past some of the other fault lines according to me we spoke a lot about savarkar which was not actually the topic of our session but you know when we talk about the indian history itself uh, one is i mentioned the inability to take the darker elements uh, talk about the darker aspects of our past but other there are several other fault lines according to me one is this whole you know delhi centricity of our history we 
if you look at our textbooks also or any popular discourse, we learn about every little dynasty that ruled Delhi. You know, Lodhis, Khiljis, Tughlaqs. I mean, what is their contribution to this country? A big zero, right? Other than being bigots. Uh, but vast parts of India, South India doesn't get featured in the manner it should in our textbooks. I was seeing the class 6, 7 and 8 NCRT books and you'll all, you can actually download it uh, you know, from the web. And you'll be shocked to see that the Cholas have probably four lines. The Vijayanagar Empire has one paragraph. Uh, Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj, today is Maharashtra Day. Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj who gave the call for Hindavi Swarajya, he has only a photograph only 25% of a small page, a photograph and a caption, that's all that a young child is going to know about someone like him. Uh, the Peshwas, the, the British actually took over India, not from the Mughals, but from the Marathas. The Marathas who had united such a vast part of India, but they don't find a place in uh, uh, you know, our books. Vast parts of southern India, the Rashtrakutas, the Chalukyas, the uh, Hoysalas, the Vodiyars of Mysore, the Travancore Maharajas, or the Northeast. How many of us really know about the Northeast of India, the Ahoms of Assam, or the Nagas, the Twipras, and all these different dynasties that ruled there, or even the people, their culture. The Northeast doesn't exist in our history books at all. So it's all about Delhi, North India. That's all that we read about, which is an important uh, fault line. The other important fault line, according to me, is that we are constantly told uh, that we have been losing wars. If you look at Indian history, it seems like a long laundry list of battles that we lost, right from the uh, you know invasions of Alexander the Great uh, to Shakas, Huns, the Arab invasion, the Turks, the Mongols, the uh, Battle of Tarain, Battle of uh, Panipat, the battles of Panipat, the Anglo-Mysore War, Anglo-Sikh War, Anglo. All these wars we have only been losing. Now today, if we are the only civilization, unlike Rome and Greece and Egypt, which is still alive and kicking, there must have been some battles that we won also, some resistance that we put. So where are these stories of resistance? Where are these heroes and heroines who are unsung, unheard of, uncommemorated? You know? <laughs> King Lalita Ditya Mukta Pida of Kashmir, uh, you know, my few next, uh, forthcoming book is on some of these unsung heroes and heroines who put up, uh, you know, um, uh, courageous resistance against invaders of all hues. Lalita Ditya of Kashmir of the Karkota dynasty, he ensured that the Arabs do not conquer any part of India beyond uh, Sindh after the invasion of Sindh. There was no reason why the Arabs could not have conquered the whole of India, but Lalita Ditya stemmed this uh, invasion of the Arabs. You had Rani Naiki Devi in Gujarat, a woman of the Chalukya uh, kingdom who defeated Muhammad Ghori, uh, and this ensured that Muhammad Ghori never came to Gujarat again. Rudrama Devi in uh, uh, Warangal, the Kakatiya ruler. Lachit Borphukon in Assam, who ensured that the Mughals do not cross over to Kamrup and occupy uh, you know, Assam. Similarly, from your state, Marthanda Varma, I mean, there should be a commemoration of Marthanda Varma all over, uh, you know, India, uh, because here was a ruler who defeated the Dutch in the Battle of Kolachal, and after that, the Dutch, uh, I would have been given, giving this, uh, you know, talk in Dutch if, if not for Marthanda Varma, because we would have been colonized by them. So, uh, so, after that, the power of the Dutch East India Company collapsed globally. So someone like him, in, from my state of Karnataka, you had Rani Abbakka Devi uh, Chautha, who defeated the Portuguese uh, and drove them out of Ullal. Similarly, you know, Kanhoji Angre from Maharashtra, who constantly kept the Portuguese and the British at bay. Velu Nachiar from Tamil Nadu, who, from Shivaganga, the Ramnath Samsthanam who uh, was the first woman to give a resistance to the English East India Company. So where are all these stories uh, you know, of resistance? Why don't we know about them? So I think when we're talking of reimagining Indian history, just as all those unknown, unsung uh, freedom fighters, revolutionaries, 
I think these names also need to come out into the open and they need to be talked more uh, for especially today's and the future generation. Yes, absolutely. But uh, yes, there are unsung heroes. Uh, there are like the resistance in which our people you know, fought against like Martha and Varma or even the Cholas or Pallavas and you know, we are not taught. Why? Because like, uh, you know, what I see is like the left historians, no? Even they are telling that the, the identity of India was a gift of the people you know, who actually emasculated us. Like the Britishers gifted us the idea of India. So, I mean like, uh, you know, we as a people of India, or I, uh, myself as a, as a person who is working in academics, is it really like, is there a hope that if they, the narrative is like that, the idea of India is gifted to you, so by the Britishers. So, where actually is the fact? That is such an unfortunate uh, reality that, you know, even educated uh, Indians somehow believe that India was not even a nation. Uh, we were just disparate kingdoms fighting with each other. And it was the British who gave us this sense, they stitched together, hammered together these disparate elements into one country. They gave us everything from railways to education to more hospitals and everything. And but for them, we would still be in some medieval wars, fighting each other, cutting each other's throats. But uh, you know, a nation and a nation state. A nation state may be defined by territories, boundaries, a set of codified laws. But a nation, as such, is a shared sense of emotional well-being for a common territorial or cultural entity. And in that aspect, India has always been a nation, a rashtra. And we see that, I mean, even when in Hindu uh, rituals, when the sankalpam is done, when the invocation is done, you mark out that jo sacred geography. Jambudvipe, Bharata Varshe, Bharata Khande. When we say that, what is this Bharata Varsha? What is this Bharata Khanda? Uh, if it was not a nation. And you have the Vishnu Puran, which uh, some say was written in the 9th century, some say it was written in 400, 500 BC, whatever be the uh, date of composition, it has this very, very clear enunciation of what this nation is. Uttaram yat samudrasya himadraschaiva dakshinam varshatat bharatam nama bharati yatra santati. Uh, the, the, this landmass north of the ocean and south of the Himalayas is that Varsha, Varsha or country is known as Bharata and its uh, children are called Bharatiyas. It also goes on to say the geographical expanse, it has about 9,000 Yojanas, uh, you know, there are um, Kiratas on the east, the Yavanas on the west, so it also talks about the people who inhabit this landmass. When you go to the Mahabharata, the Bhishma Parva has about 70 verses which talk specifically about the geography, the ethnography, the anthropology of India as it existed then right from Kashmir to uh, Malwa to Bengal to Assam, Kamarupa to Kuntala or um, you know um, um, Andhra, Telangana, Karnataka, Chera, all these uh, places are clearly mentioned in the Mahabharata. It talks about the various Janapadas which lived in India the Shabaras, the Kiratas, the Yavanas, the Mlechas, all these people. So there is a very, very clear enunciation of the idea of a nation. Um, the, and how the foreign travelers saw India, whether it was Fahien or Huan Sang. Uh, Huan Sang, when he came to India, he called this land as uh, Intu. Uh, and the Persians too, they always called it Hind. What is this Al-Hind? the land which was to the other side of the Indus River. So they also saw it as one common unit. So this common unified sphere of cultural circulation that was constantly going, I think the greatest manifestation of that comes from another, you know, stalwart from your state and from for the whole of India, which is Adi Shankaracharya. I mean, coming from Kaladi, there was no need for him to have gone across the length and breadth of India. It was not a coincidence that he established the four cardinal mat mathas at Sringeri in the south, uh, Dwarka in the west, uh, Badrinath and Puri uh, in the north and east. 
he literally marked the geography of this nation before finally establishing the Sarvagnya Peet in Kashmir uh, and the Sharada Peet there. So there was a reason and every time he went there, he did not face opposition saying, why are you coming to my country, right? Uh, so the very fact that he could travel through the entire nation showed that this was one cultural unit. There may be politically different kingdoms and the kings may have been fighting each other, but for common people, this was one common sphere of cultural circulation. And the way our pilgrimages, uh, you know, from time immemorial, they have been instituted. It, I think, is a fascinating blend of environmental consciousness, patriotism, and kind of, you know, geographical unification. Because everything is sacred in India, from mountains to forests to rivers to lakes and everything. And if it also, I think, in my view, uh, it tries to stem any kind of regional parochialism. If I feel my land is very, uh, uh, you know, sacred, there are hundred others which are equally sacred, if not more. So the uh, 51 Shakti Peethas, which were uh, scattered across India, or the Jyotirlingas, which were again scattered across India. There was a reason for this, that everything was not concentrated in one place. It was scattered across the length and breadth of India uh, through pilgrimages. So how did people from the far south, from Kerala, if they had to go on a pilgrimage to Badrinath or Kedarnath, today it is so easy to just take a flight and go somewhere. So traversing these rocky terrains, traversing different, many times they would actually lose their lives in the course of the pilgrimage. How did they understand each other's languages? Was there, was there a translator always who would help them, uh, you know, go through this? So despite all this, they managed to do what they did our ancestors. That itself shows that there was this common sense, shared sense of history, a common sense of nationhood, which far predates British colonialism or, dare I say, even the institution of the Indian Constitution in 1950, which just gave us a codified set of laws and earmark boundaries for us to act as a modern state. But the Indian civilizational state or a nation, uh, the concept of nation, I think goes much, much beyond that. Really fascinating. Uh, really fascinating. And Vikram, I think it's time to open up for a few questions from the audience. Uh, you know, before that, let me just tell the uh, rules of this uh, Q&A. Like, you can ask short questions, short and precise, so that Vikram can answer in a short and succinct way. So try to ask. Can someone give him a mic, a uh, proper mic? Namaste, my name is Raj Loka. We are really blessed to have truth seekers like you in our country. We need more people like you. Uh, I have two questions in my mind. One is about, we all know that Kashi Vishwanath Temple is the heart of all Hindus in our country and the whole world. So we all know about the uh, wound of what happened to the whole of the humanity in the Kashi issue. So even now, a section of people is not uh, ready to accept the truth and do what is essential now, at least by now. And the second question is about the halal certification, uh, the organization which gives the halal certification, and what are the cases they do in the Supreme Court? Who are they standing for? Thank you. I think the second one is not related to history, so I, I would the first one. You are right that, you know, I, as I mentioned, uh, 40,000 temples in the least, the least estimate, which were destroyed in those several centuries of uh, invasions and conquests. I don't think anyone is saying reclaim all of them. It's not possible. Much water has flown under that bridge. But there are certain sacred spots, Ayodhya was one, Kashi Vishwanath, Mathura, all these places are very central to the Hindu psyche. And all that people are asking is, can we have those places back? Like in the case of Ayodhya, it was uh, f um, barring the 1992 incident, the Hindus have 
uh, through a very very peaceful and with the uh, you know faith in the judiciary and courts we have reclaimed our uh, you know um, temple back our sacred spot back now but even that was and in that the role of several of these eminent historians uh, you know kk mohammed in his book talks about how the muslim community was willing to give away that land but it was these historians romila thapar irfan habib and several others who said no no we have a very strong case we will fight it i think there needs to be a a, a trial there as to how they misled the nation how they led to polarization between communities how they falsified history irfan habib is famous to have given wrong evidences to the court you uh, must read dr meenakshi jain's book the battle for rama where she talks about the entire falsification of evidences that were provided by leftist historians so all this has happened uh, kashi too is something that uh, i hope these places are at least we are able to reclaim those even in muslim countries for routine purposes like you know widening a road or laying a railway line masjids are moved away uh, they are shifted routinely unlike the prana pratishtha that is done in a hindu temple there is nothing like that in a masjid it's just a place where people congregate to pray so th if not here they can pray 10 kilometers away so i do hope that these eminent historians do not meddle in cases like kashi and mathura and further create bad blood between the two communities and i hope a lot of the muslim community also sees uh, the hindu sentiment for these places these are not just places but there's a lot of aastha there is a lot of faith in that and so uh, uh, voluntarily giving up of some of these in return for some other you know space extra land has been given now in ayodhya for the masjid to come about so what is the harm in that for the larger cause of social harmony i think that should be done yeah uh, are all the records still available from the british times because they were meticulous record keepers or have they been selectively destroyed uh, specifically uh, with the reference to the nehru memorial library museum sonia was sitting on it it's only recently she has been taken out and i know for a fact that if you had to do research there she had to personally vet you before you could enter that place i have been told this by a leftist journalist okay one second thing was is do we have any records of congress deliberations about congress deliberations about what attitude to take towards the disbanded soldiers from the world war 2 army of british india thank you that's a great that's a great question and you know i was a senior research fellow at the nmml till about recently uh, and it was quite poetic justice to have someone research on savarkar and get a nehru memorial fellowship so which uh, again was a, a, a you know a turn of fate so to say uh, now the things are much better there i think you can access a lot of documents though some of nehru's private papers are still not accessible completely because it comes under the purview of the family and uh, many of those are not made uh, available why in india even uh, in britain uh, recently there's been a historian who's been trying the very best to get edwina mountbatten and nehru's letters uh, out but that also has not happened because wonder what is there in those letters other than the romantic overtures but there must have been something else which is why the people are scared but talking about the british records i think they're meticulously uh, you know cataloged and preserved for someone like uh, a historian like me who depends on sources of the past particularly for modern india uh, right from the 18th century onwards the east india company records the uh, colonial records they are maintained at the british library uh, and the national archives of uk in a very very meticulous fashion yes but one has to go there and uh, you know access those good afternoon sir myself shekhar uh, and um, actually i am a fan by of yours to be frank it's a good moment for me good 
comment for me. You have read, you have written many books on server card, but however, my favorite place of favorite book obviously goes to this uh, Splendors of Royal Mysore. It's a wonderful book, to be frank. It's my, still my personal favorite. Okay, I'll just directly come to the question. See, till now, everyone knows, including me, you know, see, during, during the studying of our history, we know about Lord Macaulay, Lord Mountbatten, etc. But there are many unsung heroes like Sukhdev and many other heroes which we don't know. Till now, our history has been written like this. Uh, due to this many historians like Romila, Tapar, etc., they have taken care because they are mainly, as you said, they are mainly co focused on Saint Delhi and all this come, uh, stories comes around Saint Delhi centric only. So uh, when the go this new government when come to power, they just try to make sure that some of our new old cultures coming back to our history books. Then the, there was a um, huge cry saying that saffronism is coming over history. They are rewriting the history, etc. Now the government has moved for a silent man. But the saddest part is that till now we are unaware about our true culture and true history. Till now what we are studying is the false history which is a narrative one to some of the leftist seculars as we say and a feudal seculars like they say. And for the same there are some media people who we call prostitutes. They obviously support them and for making the focus that when, whenever the government is trying to come to the new correct uh, culture, they're saying that they are saffronizing to it, they are rewriting the history. So my question is that, is there any permanent solution? Or the, um, as a people like you, Nerekadanji, uh, or Sarji, etc., how you can uh, involve ourselves to make the government to make sure that our future generation, at least our future generations, will come to a real, to understand about what is our true culture, etc. That's my first question. Second question is a lighter one. Obviously, um, Raghunathanji and uh, you normally talk on a very um, uh, neutral side, or sorry, uh, or uh, according to the seculars, it's a what is a pro-rightist side, you say. But uh, are you facing any difficulties or a personal ban when it comes to some channels? Because what I am asking this question is that when there is a neutral person in Kerala, when he goes to uh, some debates, he has been now currently banned in debates because um, he is uh, talking in a very neutral sense and he is talking the right questions. His name is Mr. Srijit Panikar. And um, uh, actually, I want to quote his name because he is now banned in e debates in Malayalam channels because he is taking a right stand and they think that he is a pro-right wing. If he is in the debate, we will not come to the debate. So obviously, to uh, rate their um, um, uh, ratings, the channels will be normally remove them like that. So are you facing, you guys are facing any kind of difficulties like that? This is a lighter question. These are the two questions I have. Thank you. I think When it comes to me, I, uh, I actually avoid going to news channels because I don't see much uh, uh, merit in all that noise that is there. But our most uh, ubiquitous, ever seen, most popular face on news channels, Dr. Anand Ranganathan, who in 30 seconds demolishes everyone who <laughs> all that he needs is 30 more seconds Navika, 30 more seconds Ra Rahul. Uh, but that's all that is needed. I don't think he faces any ban as such. I think he will be better placed to answer. I think we choose not to go to some channels, maybe like an NDTV or something, who try to call us, but we perhaps don't go. Maybe the English media is slightly different from what the Malayalam media is. I share your angst, sir, about the first aspect of, uh, you know, our future generations not reading the right history. And it is very, very disappointing that after so many years, eight years have passed and we are still going through the same textbooks of NCRT. One entire generation would have passed with this. Uh, the books, uh, you know, written by the likes of uh, Harsh Mandar and Nandini Sundar and Ram Guha and all these people, th those are the books that uh, our students are reading. And we had a former HRD minister who very proudly said, not a word has been changed in our history textbook, which is very sad. But I think governments operate uh, on, I mean, in a, in a positive sense through lobbying. So they think people don't care much about this issue. But once more and more of, you know, common citizens of India uh, actually start putting this out, and you now have the biggest tool of social media with you, through social media, if a lot of you put out this angst out, saying we do not want our children to read this fabricated history, and the government uh, will respond only when there is a mass civil, uh, you know, uh, the civil movement or the civil uh, response reaches a critical mass. Till then, I don't think they think that this is so important. You have committees after committees being set up to uh, study this, while all it takes is six months 
to put a set of people together in one room and get the, I mean, to say correct history, again, is a euphemism because there is, as I said, there's nothing absolute about history. They're all interim reports. So these changes will happen. Tomorrow, this government will go. Some other a, a new government of a different color might come. Then they will change the history books. So this constant tussle is inevitable. These uh, tags are not something we should bother about, saffronization, etc. So these are just told. But I think a, a need is to have real experts, real uh, you know, scholars who could sit together and rewrite um, the history. In fact, recently, just two weeks back, I was in Chennai, and the Chinmaya mission there has come out with alternative textbooks for class six, seven, and eight. Uh, and this will be, and those books are written extremely well. I've been reading them. Uh, they put out what can be called as a history closer to the truth. They talk about all these unsung heroes and heroines whom I mentioned briefly, a different perspective to what the history is. But these books will probably be in circulation only in the Chinmaya and the Vidya Bharati schools, which itself is about 20,000, 20,000 schools. But when will it go to the CBSC and NCRT? That only the government of the day can do. This is cheating. <laughs> Just to answer your question, um, I was called to a news channel once uh, and the topic was uh, fake news. And uh, I told the anchor that she had spread the biggest fake news and I gave her the evidence. In fact, her fake news was so big that CBI had to come in and tell her, Madam, this is fake news. After that, I was never called to that channel. So I hope that answers your question. But uh, to Vikram's thing and uh, to the excellent question asked by Sir, there has been an authoritative book written by Sri Sitaram Goel, two volume one, on Hindu temples and what happened to them. And Vikram is absolutely right. There are about 44,000, if I'm not mistaken, 44,300 temples that have been totally destroyed and other structures on them. So there, if I may, I beg to disagree with Vikram. We should, or Indians should reclaim not just Kashi and Mathura, but each one of those 44,000 temples. Because no one temple is bigger or smaller than the other, less spiritual or more spiritual than the other. Thank you. You're an eternal optimist. <laughs> I'm trying to at least go to a, a least common multiple of... A very good morning, sir. It, a very good morning, sir. My name is Arjun. It's a pleasure meeting you, first of all. So my question is, uh, I have seen your session in a, in a, in a f literature fest of DC books you participated in that. Uh, there was a question from the crowd after the session when the Q&A started. There was a question from the crowd, is this session to whitewash Savaka or not? There was a question and you very beautifully answered the question. And I would like to tell you that what DC books did was after the session, the answers you given and the, the, the very beautiful answer which you gave to the crowd, they removed it from YouTube. And let me tell you as a part of the coordinators of this youth conclave, I would like to tell you that our, ins our inspiration to conduct this youth conclave was that, was that single video, which our coordinator Yuvaraj Gogol has posted in Facebook also, because these people had these people only want narratives which they like. So how do you see this very narrative? If you talk about Savaka, you have to demonize him. If you talk about Savaka, you have to speak only a portion of it. How do you see that? See, the literature festival was, is, the, is one of the biggest fest in Kerala. And, and these people have removed your portion from YouTube. What is it that is making them afraid about these things? Like when we speak up, what is it that they are afraid of? Can I add, can I add something like, you know, like, uh, I, I forgot your name, Arjun, yes, Arjun said, like, you know, the people from academics, the, the problem we face, you know, when Vikram was invited to Kerala, I sat and I searched in Google and identified the channel, you know, which actually is streaming this. And I was just spending my time in front of the YouTube to see and I finally identified it and I watched the entire program. And later I, that night, I thought, no, I should rewatch it. Or I should, uh, no, why? Because the information it's, which he was giving in that session was fabulous. Something which was unknown for people like us in academics. 
So, but night I came to know that the people who actually promote the free speech, they call themselves as the promoters of free speech, they have taken away the video. You know, like Vikram as a person, no? I mean like you were the one who actually attended the session and you know, what was the feeling, like the feeling you underwent, like your session is complete blackout. And these are not the people, no, they, they call themselves as the promoters of free speech. In fact, that session was so stormy that uh, it had to be cut short midway. Uh, and I had a very good friend of mine in Calicut who came literally like a bodyguard. She and her husband and her father, all of them came there. It was a huge beach. So she said, anything can happen there. Someone can just come and stab you. So you're not staying at all for, uh, you know, beyond your session. And literally took me away. So when your invitation came, I literally had two thoughts in my mind. Should I again take the risk of going to Kerala? <laughs> so, but then, you know, I uh, said, no, I think we won. If you keep getting subdued and scared of people, then you can't do anything in life. No, that was a very shocking incident because uh, the amount of hostility that came from the crowd was something that I didn't expect. I knew that there would be disagreements and talking about Savarkar in Calicut and so on is quite a challenge. But uh, the, the very fact that they took down the video and they gave me, and I openly brought it up on Twitter also saying, why only that session has been deleted? All the other sessions are very much there. Why only this session has been deleted? So DC Books, I think, gave a very stupid answer. There was some technical error in the uh, uh, digitization. And so that's why we have pulled it down. Now there's lockdown, so we could not get a new person to all kinds of bunkum. So, but you're so right. I mean, the left is something we wrongly, you know, concatenate the word and say left liberal. I think there is nothing liberal about the left, not only in India, but world over, all through its history. Uh, whether it is in China, whether it is in Russia, whether it's in any country, Kerala, Bengal, nowhere, where it is only muzzling any op opposite point of view. A true democracy, a true, uh, you know, free democracy is one where there are differences of opinion, dissent, discussion, debate, and the left does not tolerate or promote that, uh, particularly if they say sunlight is the best disinfectant. So when sunlight is thrown on a topic that they have carefully nurtured for so many decades of demonizing Savarkar, you know, hiding so many facts under the table, obviously there is a backlash that, you know, we can't afford to take. But this is very, very unfortunate and I'm very sad that a literature festival which should actually thrive on multiple opinions, give a platform. Why at all call me if you had to uh, censor me? Uh, you know, that is very unfortunate, but that's the nature of the beast. And not only this, as most of you know, I live under constant attacks from the left. Uh, now, not only from India, but even outside India. Uh, but then I think they don't know that I'm made of sterner stuff, so I do take them straight to the courts also when need be file cases against them. I think that's the constant way of dealing with uh, such malcontents. Uh, my name is Rahul Balajandran. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you so much for giving two volume uh, Savarkar uh, uh, biography. I have both of them. I have finished the first volume and uh, yet to start with the second. Uh, so in one of the promotional videos or uh, some discussions in P Guru, I heard you mentioning about uh, referring 40,000 uh, uh, records in Europe and US while writing this uh, uh, book. So how did you get uh, access to those records? That is my first question. And the second one is uh, uh, recently Mahesh uh, Manjarekar announced a movie on, uh, a biopic movie on uh, Veer Savarkar. Is that book uh, all about, uh, or is, is that book based on your uh, uh, 
biography. No, sadly, th that is not based on my biography, I think. Uh, but there would be a movie which we would very shortly be announcing, uh, which would be based on my uh, two-volume biography on Savarkar. Uh, I think there is a need to convert uh, so much of research into a medium which will reach out to a lot of people. Now, it's very, very, as Sir had asked earlier, it's very easy to access, unlike India where, uh, you know, going to an archive is a nightmare for a scholar, where there's so much of bureaucratic red tape and so many forms you have to fill, you can only uh, photocopy 10%, 20% of a record. Uh, in the UK particularly, it's very, very scholar friendly. So the National Archives of UK or even the uh, British Library in London, uh, the 40,000 papers that I mentioned, you can actually take your camera there and take photographs of the records. So, you know, I spent about 10 days in London and photographed so many things, then I would we transfer all of that back home to my father who would then, uh, you know, take printouts, compile it uh, into nine. By the time I came back from London, there were a series of, uh, you know, uh, nice uh, uh, bound copies of all the records that I had found there. Of course, there's so much more which could have come into the books. In fact, initially I wanted it to become a three volume biography, but my uh, publishers, Penguin said, you know, this is not one of Amish Tripathi kind of a thriller which goes on for several, uh, you know, series, you better restrict it to two volumes. So a lot of it got left out. So I hope some of that can actually find its way, including uh, in the movie, maybe when it comes out. Thank you. My name is Sajit Kumar. My question is, has any Congress leader or leftist leader faced imprisonment in Kalapani? I am asking this because only for a simple reason. Because these two groups fit maximum uh, venom against Savarkar. No. Actually, all those who were there in Kalapani were all revolutionaries. Uh, so no Congress leader was ever sent to the Kalap, uh, to Andamans. Most of them were in jails in India. Not to say that they all led a life of luxury in the jails. The common satyagrahis, they also faced a lot of uh, trouble. But then several of the leaders, uh, Gandhiji being in Aga Khan Palace for so many years, or even Nehru where his, uh, his daily routine in the jail when you see, you know, badminton, then getting home cooked food, you are given uh, pen and paper to write letters to your daughter, so it's, and the, the condition of the jail itself, which was quite, you know, luxurious compared to what the people in Kalapani faced, where basic human facilities of food and toilet and uh, medical uh, health, uh, you know, support was not given to many of the political prisoners. Uh, many of them had to defecate and urinate in their own cells. And imagine sitting amidst your own squalor all day and eating and sleeping there. Uh, so that was the kind of tortures that people at Kalapani faced, which was nowhere close to what several of these people faced. And the Koluka Bell punishment, where all day in the blazing heat of Port Blair, they had to go around the oil grinding machine and extract 30 pounds of oil. Uh, and if you, at the end of the day, this would be measured. And if you don't extract that amount of oil, you would be flogged uh, or not given food. Even the food that was given would have pieces of reptiles and insects and all of that and eating that most of them would uh, get diarrhea and going to the toilet was also fixed timings in the day you couldn't go when you wanted so this kind of inhuman tortures that they faced uh, this was only for the armed struggle the revolutionaries of India who struggled there but ask a young person today name 10 people who uh, you know suffered in Kalapani 10 people or five five names of people who uh, you know, struggled there. I don't think a young person would be able to name those five people. So, in fact, when you go to the cellular jail, you see an entire plaque there, which has the names of all the 200 odd political prisoners who were there from various uh, states, largely Bengal, some from Maharashtra, Punjab, Tamil Nadu, UP, United Provinces and all that. And when I went there, I literally stood there, fro you know, frozen, seeing those names. And as I said earlier, thought came to me that what an ungrateful nation we are. 
you know, thanks to these people who gave their youth, who gave everything uh, that was going for them. Today, you and I are able to breathe uh, in free India uh, and live happily. But the least we do is to remember their names. We don't even do that. And that is a very sad part of the way history is, I think, taught to us. Um, and in fact, I remembered what, when Suraj had asked me earlier about, did any other people write petitions and so on? We know this other famous incident of how uh, Jawaharlal Nehru, when after staying in the Nabha jail for 14 days, um, he was so demotivated and uh, disorganized that, you know, um, disoriented, that his father actually went to the viceroy and said, please release my son. And Nehru is supposed to have signed a bond saying he would never enter Nabha again. Uh, you know, and then these are the same people who also bring up this idea of petition and that you sold out and so on. So I think that really needs to be relooked uh, in the face of historical facts. Uh, we are actually running out of time. Uh, this would be the last question. Uh, namaste, sir. Uh, so firstly, I'm very uh, blessed actually to hear all your words here. and. I too belong to the uh, generation or batch who has read those NCRT books and was unaware of what the actual history of our country was. So it was really eye-opening for me. And my question is, uh, what is your uh, opinion on the negationism that we face? Like almost all of us who are present, like many people throughout the nation and all, they do know about the facts, at least on a rough note, of what has happened in our history. but while coming to the fact of admitting it or talking about it or when people talk about those facts, they're not ready to accept it. But without acceptance, I don't think we can bring a change or uh, we can look for a change in our minds and all. So what is your opinion on that negationism and denial of fact? Very good. That's a very good question. That, and that is the whole bane of what I've been trying to talk in the last hour or so as to how negating things, brushing things under the carpet, uh, thinking that this is going to upset today's modern society. When you do that, these fault lines don't go away. You know, the edifice of national unity cannot rest on the shaky foundations of whitewashed history. Uh, it's, a, it's a false notion that national unity, social cohesion, can all be maintained by whitewashing uncomfortable truths. Negation also comes in the fact that we negate the civilizational greatness of India. You know, as a young person yourself, I, I'm sure when you were reading your NCRT books or whatever, you feel that you're not reading the story of your country, you're reading it about some other, you know, third, in third person, you're accessing your own country's story, which is not how it needs to be. Uh, the othering of uh, India, uh, you know, constant denial of the civilizational greatness of India in various fields. It could be philosophical, linguistic, uh, architecture, uh, poetry, literature, uh, medicine, astronomy, uh, alchemy and mathematics and all these, metallurgy and all of that. We, we have so little that we know about it. In fact, um, my good friend uh, Rohan Murthy, um, you know, who started the Rohan, uh, the Murthy Classical Library, he used to tell me that when he was a student in the U.S., uh, many of the other, you know, Oriental societies, students who came from Oriental societies like, say, Japan or China and all, when they would have conversations, they could tell people what were the achievements of your ancestors, what were the achievements of your civilization. And he said, when even think of it yourself, when someone asks you, what is it that you need to be proud of as an Indian? We really have to think a lot, right? I mean, we just, yeah, we invented zero. Uh, we, are, we are given these very, very specious uh, examples. But beyond this Mera Bharat Mahan and Jingoism and all of that that we all always have, what are the genuine achievements of our ancestors, of our past that we can be truly proud of? And that goes beyond pol politics, ideology. It's about the nation. It's about our country, our ancestors, our past. Uh, sadly, uh, you know, negating India's civilizational greatness becomes like a fashion statement. Oh, I, I consider this very regressive. We are constantly made to feel apologetic about our past. 
divisions, whether it is caste division, caste oppression, these are the only things that we talk about when we talk about our past, not talking about the genuine achievements of the past. So I think that's a very pertinent point and that is where a reimagining of history to bring out these aspects. I'm not saying that the bad elements, whether it's caste oppression, whether it is invasions, all of these also need to be spoken about. But along with that, the, the, the civilizational greatness for thousands of years, our ancestors did not sit quiet here. We are a knowledge seeking society. We are a society that celebrates knowledge. So all that we have created, can that be of some utility today to people? I'm not saying everything that was there in the past was great. That is another extreme of jingoism where you say, we knew nuclear physics, uh, the atom bomb was there in the Mahabharat, you had flying cars, aeroplanes, that is another level of uh, stupidity. But then a lot of genuine things that we can be proud of as a civilization, I think it's very important that we you know, talk about this. If it's not available in our academic curriculum, it should be through outside the system, like, you know, people like us who need to write about it. And with social media now, information dissemination is not a big problem.